Hi, I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings coming to you from Primary Vision Network. So today we have our FSC show. And then instead of doing the full economy show, just because we were bouncing around a lot, I'm just going to do the two episodes on the U.S. looking at inflation because I, I was getting a lot of questions and I think it's important to understand where is inflation now? Where is it going? Because we've we've heard that there was no inflation, which is incorrect. It's just with the rate of change was zero. But again, we'll we'll talk about that under the econ show. So when we look at just the uh, the primary vision frac spread count, we fell by four. So we went from two hundred eighty nine to two hundred eighty five, and it, it was really. Uh, there was just a small decline in the in the Permian. You know, when you look at where things are going, the smaller basins continue to not have much activity. And one of the things that we were saying is as we get into this week, there was a view that, well, at least, at least I had said, we're either going to start to go up or just stay flat because typically you, you can get an extra week of either slightly down or just flat before we get a little bit more of a push into September. And here you can see that we had a small decline. But now with that, we have crude prices that have stabilized. We have the rig count, especially on the crude side, starting to stabilize. This is where, again, we're not going to explode up to 350 spreads, but the, the trajectory is still very clear up towards that, that 300 level. Now, it's interesting when you start looking at the EIA data when, you're, when we're talking about... Um, production because we're right at that 12.2 number. And we do think that there's a little bit of a movement to the upside. But if at the beginning of last year, we had uh, at the beginning of uh, the end of last year, we had talked about a, a range of 12.2 to 12.4 million barrels a day on an exit rate. And then we had refined it to about 12.2. So here, I, th I think that that still holds. We could get some movement to 12.3. But again, we're going to stay fairly close because we don't see a huge surge in activity. Now, things have gotten more efficient. We have dual fracking, simul frac, depending on your nomenclature. But it's not like we're going to get this huge amount of work. There's a lot of uh, the headwinds in terms of uh, pipe availability. All of those things are getting better, but it doesn't mean they've gone away. So that's what we keep talking about when we're looking at some of these headwinds that continue to come through. So when uh, then when we take it to the next level, obviously natural gas continues to be supportive, NGL flows continue to be supportive. So we we don't see anything that's really going to push down pricing in a way that would hinder the economics, keeping things fairly robust. Now, when we look at just the activity in the market uh, on the rig side, here you can see that there were three oil get oil rigs coming in. Uh, we lost one gas and then down three miscellaneous. When you look at it, directional was up two, vertical up two, horizontal was down five. Now, horizontal finally went down. Uh, we've had very steady increases where even if the rig count was down, you still had horizontals that have been going up. So this is actually the first time that we've had a decline in the horizontal in, in, in several weeks. And, and that's something where it just shows the activity. Again, we've talked about the duck count where we already had it starting to, uh, to flatline. And now we do uh, see ducks or drilled but uncompleted wells starting to increase. So one of the things that we talked about on the, on the EIA show is just we, we continue to see a lot of this buildup in crude in the Middle East and this slowdown in Asia. Now, there's been uh, another uh, a headwind in China. They are shutting down another uh, facility, a, a key area for exports, which is why uh, we've talked so much about some of the issues that are continuing. And it played out again in their data, which we'll discuss next week when we look at how their imports completely underwhelmed, which is a big issue when we're looking at just local consumption within China. Now, we just wanted to talk briefly about this, so the because we talk about seasonality, what does seasonality mean? And one of the things that we've been highlighting is that this is very similar to 2017 when you look at just the activity that we are seeing or expecting coming into uh, the end of August into September. And when you look at, at 2018, you get that white line, you can see that there was that rally really into, uh, into September. When you look at 20, uh, 2017, something very similar. And then at the same time, when you look at 2015 into 2016, you had those increases and that's where we, we expect it. But you can see just from the blue line or 2022, that light blue line, 
we've just been very steady, steady pace. And, and there's been some ups and downs within that. And, and it's uh, something that we do expect to continue to see that move towards 300. But again, it's really just going to be that push into September, you know, starting now, starting to get the back up to 295 spreads, and then really getting that additional, that delta of five to maybe 10 between September and October. And then every single year without fail, you have that big drop off once you come into Thanksgiving. And then that slowdown that persists from Thanksgiving into year end. So again, not too much uh, to say in terms of just craziness, it's just that we're not going to 15 million barrels a day of, of production. It's just that very steady pace. And then when we look in twenty uh, in twenty twenty three, you know the exit rate we see there is about twelve point eight to twelve point nine, but that's about it. We don't see another big surge that we've seen in previous or expectations. You know when we were out when I was at Bloomberg, I was saying that Reistead was crazy to think that we were going to have. I think they said nineteen million barrels a day of export. It's like there is or uh, production. It's like there isn't enough physical pipe in the ground to manage that. So where are you seeing these numbers? But that's where, you know, that 13.1, we could get there. Again, it's not to say that we will. It's just a very measured increase. And then we get to the steady state. Now, there's always going to be uh, an innovation in terms of maybe refracts or some sort of uh, way to unlock additional crude in place. But that's where we're going to continue to, to watch. And again, these aren't firm numbers as, as we talked about estimates, but there is some of that uh, additional upside. So the Rhine uh, continues to get worse. Uh, they are now shutting down some of the areas. It's crossed over in the EIA show. We talked about a key level that has now gone be, uh, below. This is just another huge hit to the German economy in terms of moving things. This is a key waterway that has been needed to move product. And it's just going to create more inflationary pressures, more supply side issues, which again is going to continue to build. And you get an idea of where it's at its its worst with that with that white component. So again, we've already started to see the shutdowns. It is now getting below the critical level. So we are seeing things stop. Now, as that is being the case, Germany base load electricity one year forward price and France, you can see that they are now at records and it's just continuing to go up. It's going to cut utilization rates. It's going to just be more inflationary pressure within within Europe. And these are the kind of issues that we look at when you look at the U.S., we import from Germany, we import from Europe. So it's just you're going to have some of these inflationary pressures that are outside of the U.S.'s control that we're going to import. So even as things slow, the rate of change slows there's still that stagflationary backdrop because these are inflationary pressures as we get some of the deflationary side. And we'll talk about it in the, the two special episodes on inflation, but realistically, it's very honed in on energy. Energy was what drove the decline while we still had increases in price everywhere else. So it's very specific in terms of where that is headed. And now when you look at the seaborne oil imports by source, and this is when you consider Europe, it's important to, to appreciate why the Rhine is important, where a lot of this is coming from, and how is Russia going to replace that? So these are the different pieces when you look at the U.S., you know, the uh, when the U.S. is is exp in importing a significant amount from obviously other parts of the Americas, as well as the Middle East. And then we're, we are seeing more from Africa, the European Union. You can see how much comes from Russia. And that is what it has to be replaced when they stop by pipe, when they put more pressure. And that's when you've already started to see it turn into China and into India with India seeing the biggest pickup. But China is also slowing. Now, when you look at the imports since the beginning of the year, you can see that things have been trending to the downside just based on demand within the region, the amount of, of crude in storage, the uh, and obviously the lockdowns are hitting where India has been increasing some of their, uh, but the one big piece that we've talked about is that African component, especially in China, where you can see it getting, it's shrinking, where in the European Union, it's starting to widen back out. So as Russia drops, we expect more Russian crude to show up that blue in China and India and West Africa or Africa in general, starting to come more into the European Union and the US, just to give you an idea and to try to visualize how these flows continue to shift. 
Then when you look at gas exports to the EU, you're getting an idea that Russia continues to drop. And you, when you're looking at the piece, how much can Norway re, uh, it replace, but they're having a hydro problem. They're starting to, to say, you know, uh, is there going to be a cap on natural gas exports as well as electricity exports from Norway? So that puts uh, you know some additional pressure to the downside LNG also coming from Russia, which is going to go away. So this drop, so it's not just crude, but it's also where are they going to get natural gas? You know, how much can come from LNG? You have China taking more piped gas, which is going to put more LNG in the market, which they can try to absorb and change. But again, these are some of the key problems that are going to continue to arise, keeping those inflationary pressures, that energy uh, cost elevated. And again, it's going to make it a very interesting uh, uh, winter, to say the least, when we when we look at everything from electricity to natural gas for heating, coal for heating, coal for electricity can generation. And the U.S. is really no different. So that's why when we look at energy, we do see some upside to that energy inflation, which we're going to talk about in our special uh, econ episodes just because we missed the five. So we want to cover that. But that's what we have for you on the, on today's FSC show. If you have any questions, again, you can find us on, on the comment section on Twitter. So, And we always appreciate your support. And thanks for watching. I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you for Primary Vision Network.